NJ4Z here. My name is John. I'm in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and I'm with the York County Amateur Radio Society. I did the presentation uh, for the club on uh, live stream with YouTube on September 23rd. And unfortunately, the club had some technical issues either with the internet or computer, uh, and the quality of the stream and the quality of the upload was not great. So I decided to re record it. I'm not doing it live, obviously. Uh, we're doing it as a uh, uh, taped presentation or a videoed presentation, uh, pre-recorded, I guess is the proper term. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy this. What we're going to be talking about is using solar terrestrial data for HF propagation prediction. Uh, we're going to talk about more than just solar terrestrial, but uh, a good concentration on solar terrestrial. The reason I'm doing this presentation um, is we have a lot of new members. Our club is growing rapidly. And we've got a lot of new members that are coming in from technician and switching to general. They're getting on the HF bands. And one of the questions is being a mentor in the club or an Elmer in the club. Uh, a lot of us get the same question. What is the HF band propagation going to look like today? What band should I use? Um, where can I talk? And that makes it a little bit of a loaded question. So uh, when we start talking about HF propagation and and predicting it or knowing what it's going to do it's it, there's a lot of science behind it and there's a lot of art behind it okay so the science part of it is you know well let me go back when when we start talking about when i get those questions it's it's a loaded question for me and i like to make whoever's asking it think through what they're asking Okay, so my questions back to them are going to be, okay, what is your goal for the day? Are you doing POTA? Are you hunting DX? Uh, uh, what kind of equipment are you using? What kind of antenna are you using? Because as we know, antennas will tell you how much you're hearing and how good your signal gets out. Your radio is going to be have some play in this as regards to how good the receiver is, how good the filtering is. And then, of course, um, what time of day you're going out and where are you going to be located? And, of course, what are you trying to do? If you're trying to do POTA and it's just continental U.S., that's one thing you can look at and I can give you some really good ideas. And then if you're hunting DX, that's a whole different animal. Now you're talking about long distance or DX propagation. And um, so you have to think through those things. But where you basically start at is once you know what your equipment is and what your goal is for today, then you want to look at the solar terrestrial data. Okay. And, you know, knowing what your antenna is, so it's a vertical or, or dipole, how high it is up, those kind of things will tell you takeoff angle and geometry of what you're looking at for propagation. Then you can use tools like propagation software and the beacon network. Uh, so you, the beacon network will let you take a look at what you can hear from different areas of the globe. And then also, um, you know, HF propagation uh, software, uh, you can use that to kind of predict and give you best chances and time of day and those kind of things. We'll get into that a little bit deeper. And then there's the art part of this. So it's science and art, okay? Understanding propagation paths, long path, short path, uh, where to look during the day, what times of year to look for certain areas, all those things. You can learn that, and there's a lot of books that'll give you that information, a lot of videos that'll give you that information. But again, there's no, 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 no substitution for seat time, okay? Getting in front of that rig and spending time, even if you're not calling, just listening, what you can hear, right? Uh, what can you hear during the summer, at during the day? What can you hear during the summer and evening? What bands are you listening to? Um, you know, and... Pay attention when there's contests on, you know, um, if you're not even going to work the contest, put the headphones on and listen to the stations you're hearing at different parts of the day. Okay. And then, you know, gray line's a whole different other animal, right? Great. We, you hear a lot about uh, older hams and experienced hams will talk about uh, gray line propagation. And then, of course, there's sporadic E, which more lends itself to the higher frequency HF bands like 10 meters and 6 meters. Uh, but... HF is uh, spooky magic, as I call it. They call it the magic, uh, six meter of the magic band because of sporadic E. I call sporadic E the spooky stuff. So um, I still don't fully understand sporadic E. 
Uh, but uh, I understand the concept. I don't know when to predict and those kind of things. But again, that's the art part of it, experience uh, and, and working through it, okay? Uh, the science part is not too hard. But what I want to do is I'm going to start with the basics, um, go back to when you were studying for your technician or your general, and talk about how the atmosphere works, okay? So when we talk about solar output in the ionosphere, okay, the sun is a fusion reactor. And that fusion reactor puts out all kinds of different products, okay? It puts out high energy rays like X-rays, UV rays, cosmic rays. It also puts out neutrinos. It puts out plasma. It puts out UV radiation. Of course, it puts out photons, which are what we see, okay, visible light. Now, in particular, the UV component of the solar wind is responsible for ionization of the ionosphere, part of our atmosphere. So um, there's part of the atmosphere, you have a high concentration of atoms, and what happens is the UV rays come in, they break those atoms apart by stripping, not the nucleus atom, but they strip off electrons, okay, from the outer shell of the atom, and that creates an abundance of electrons and a bunch of ions, hence ionization. Um, when it strips those off, when you get a high concentration of electrons in the ionosphere, that allows uh, electromagnetic energy to be bent and refracted back to Earth. So what happens is, if we take a look at the next slide, um, you have various layers of the atmosphere. We'll talk about that in just a second. But once you start to transmit and your uh, EM path goes up and it hits the ionization or the uh, free electrons, then it will bend back to Earth at the same angle it took off from. So, and then it'll hit the Earth and it'll bounce back up. And, you know, when conditions are right, it'll keep bouncing. Now, it attenuates every time, but you still get the, the drift. It, it, it ricochets back and forth between the atmosphere and the Earth. Now, when we start talking about the ionosphere, several layers, and, and you should remember this from your um, studies for both the general and the technician tests, and even the extra to some extent. You have the ionosphere, and there's several layers of the ionosphere. You have the D, the E, and the F, and the F's broken up into two, F1, F2. There's actually F3 layer and, and some other layers, but for our purposes here, we're going to talk about the D, the E, the F1, and F2, okay? So during the day, the D layer's there, the E layer's there, F1 and F2 are there, okay? When we get high con high uh, UV radiation from the sun, that energizes not only the D layer, the E layer, but the F layers, okay? And the F are more important to us because that's where we get our refraction. Now, we can from the E. When the E's charged up good, 6 meters, 10 meters, bounce off that E layer all day long. Uh, why you don't get... Um, refraction on things like UHF and VHF for the most part is their uh, high frequency short waves so they pass through the atmosphere when you get these long waves um, like you know 80 meters 60, 160 you know and all the HF bands uh, they have the opportunity to make that bend which you don't have with the line of sight bands so during the day all the bands are uh, all the uh, layers are there and they're visible visible to the e, uh, to the electromagnetic waves you're putting off or the RF you're putting off. Now at night, uh, because the sun isn't shining directly on the D layer, kind of disappears. Uh, the E layer weakens out pretty much, and the F layer combines and becomes one. Okay, so um, you know during the day when you have a lot of energy, when D layer gets it gets charged up well, sometimes that'll cause absorption. Okay, so it's attenuation of your signal. So uh, sometimes you get a lot of energy in a D layer and propagation will be terrible that day because the, e, the D layer is eating everything up before it can get to the E and the F layers to be refracted. Uh, so when you think about looking at the, the ionosphere, don't think of it as hard shell surfaces like this diagram shows you. Think of it like cotton candy, okay? Because there's going to be areas that are going to be more highly um, ionized than other areas. So you'll have areas where there'll be really high density of um, electron, free electrons. And there'll be some areas that will be lower. And then, of course, when you get in the E uh, layer, 
you really start talking about, you know, areas of E being charged, and that's where you get sporadic E from because the whole E layer isn't completely charged. It's just areas, and it's sporadic where that signal's at. So it's more like um, apples bobbing in, in water than it is even cotton candy. Uh, you're going to have holes where it's going to pass right back through the E layer and hit the F layer. And again, that's that's a whole different discussion of, of the physics of the ionosphere for our purposes. Just think of it as cotton candy and we'll be good. Okay, so solar radiation, sunspot, sunspots, and solar cycles. Okay, so every, every 11 years the sun goes through uh, it's solar cycle. Okay. And what happens is the sun's magnetic field will rotate from a uh, North pole, South pole every 11 years, it swaps over and changes. So the North becomes South, South becomes the North. Okay. For all tents and purposes, when you start to look at it, um, during the cycle, you come out of the cycle, sunspots start to appear. And what sunspots are is basically highly concentrated areas of magnetic flux. Okay, so as those poles are moving, you get areas of the sun which will have more magnetic properties than other areas, and they'll concentrate, and you'll get these dark spots, which are cool, indicative of a cooler area on the sun. But around it, you have the umbra uh, or penumbra that's the uh, looks like kind of like an iris on an eye. If you look at the drawing up, uh, the picture up here, it kind of looks like iris around the around the um, the sunspot. Uh, that's an area where there's a lot of UV radiation coming out. And that helps us uh, with propagation. So the more sunspots we are, the more UVs coming off the sun. Now it's bad in a way because it can sunburn you a little bit harder, <laughs> get a little more sunburn. But uh, UV radiation is key to that ionization in the atmosphere, in the uh, ionosphere. So when we talk about solar cycles, again, it's 11 year cycle. When I became a ham in 2016, um, we were on the downside of cycle 24. So we were about halfway down to the to the bottom. I think the peak was 2012, 2013, uh, 2014. We saw some really good uh, sunspot numbers and some really good propagation. As I came in in 2016 and got my general late in 2016, uh, propagation was starting to drop off. Sunspots were not as prevalent. Uh, I can remember some days where propagation was pretty good or I thought was pretty good. And, and I remember seeing SFI numbers or, or solar flux numbers, which we'll talk about in a second, being in, in the 100 teens, uh, which is pretty good. But, uh, you know, as it, we came down 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, of course, we get COVID in 2022, but that's besides the point, it, they're 2020. But that just, you know, really speaks to it because we were at our sunspot minimum. So propagation was crap. Not a lot of sunspots. I, you know, days upon days upon days upon weeks upon, uh, months where we didn't have any sunspots so solar radiation was really low uv radiation was really low and not a lot of ionization now that's i think a lot of reason why um, uh, ft8 took off right because propagation was so bad that um it wouldn't support a lot of sideband stuff so it ended up uh ft8 was a way to get contacts even in bad solar condition because it's weak uh, the, it would still refract, and, and even though you had a lot of, uh, of signal being attenuated or leaving the atmosphere because it wasn't being reflect, refracted, uh, some of it was still getting back to the Earth, and people were able to make contacts. And I really do think that's part of the reason why FT8 took off the way it did. Uh, so right now we're towards the end of 2021, so uh, we're towards the uh, upswing here of the solar cycle, so uh, times are getting much better. And so uh, when we start talking about sunspots, you also have to talk about solar flaring. You have to talk about CMEs. You have to talk about coronal hole streams. You have to talk about geomagnetic storms. Okay, so solar flares are associated a lot with sunspots. Because you get the big um, areas of magnetic flux, and sunspots can be polarized, um, you know, positive, negative kind of thing, north, south, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they'll have arching, as you can see in the video, you see that little bit of arching over it. And when those things collapse or, or touch, you get a push off of energy, a high energy burst, which is a solar flare. Um, and there's a lot of UV, there's a lot of X-ray in there, and it all moves it at the speed of light. So when you're talking about 
the solar flare itself, when we see it on Earth, we're already being affected by it because the Earth being 93 million miles away from the sun, it takes about eight minutes, with, depending on where you're at in the orbit, it could be a little more than 93, a little less than 93, but let's use 93 million miles as, as the uniform number. So it takes photons from the sun to get to the Earth or any particle moving at the speed of light. So let's talk about you know X-rays, UV, uh, cosmic rays, and photons. So they're all moving at speed of light. It takes eight minutes for that day that um, ray to come from the sun to us before we can see it so uh, when a photon hits us you're looking at the sun you're actually looking back in history eight to eight and a half minutes okay so when the sun erupts and we see that bright pop on the surface of the sun which is a solar flare it happened eight minutes ago or thereabouts and we're already being affected by the byproducts now i've noticed in some cases propagation will jump <clears throat> pretty rapidly when we have a solar flare for a few minutes or you know a few seconds few minutes and that's the u the uv and the x-rays hitting the atmosphere uh before the big concentration come in because uh, the solar flare can re release energy at a different a different rate as it's as it's flaring so when you get that first little bit it ionizes the atmosphere and then what happens is once the the bulk of that energy gets there the the energy starts to really interact then it takes propagation out you get too much x-ray and, and ionization and the d layers absorbing and there's just all kinds of mess so uh, we'll get a little more into that science and then you have cmes now cmes and are are basically ejections of plasma and charged particles from from the sol solar surface or from the corona so when you get a solar flare it can eject material now you can you can get cmes without solar flares um, you may get a filament lifting off and, and it blows plasma at the, at the earth, okay? So you get this heavy stream of plasma coming. It travels slower than speed light, sometimes takes a day or two, maybe three, depending on the, how fast it was ejected uh, to get to the atmosphere. Now, when that gets here, um, it tends to turn, you know, uh, turn the, the magnetosphere and the ionosphere on its on its ear, so you get a lot of noise on the bands and, and uh, a lot of bad propagation. And then coronal holes are less dense areas of the corona, and high speed particles, high speed solar wind. There's less less material to slow down the plasma and the particles as they're coming, charged particles as they're coming towards Earth. So you get higher speeds. It impacts the the magnetosphere and the ionosphere uh, at a higher rate. It may not be as dense, but as a CME, but at the rate you're still talking about stirring up that magnetic field and the um, uh, ionosphere to the point where uh, propagation becomes difficult. Okay, so you take a look. This is a solar flare here uh, going off. And then you can kind of see what an impact does. So this is the magnetic field. And you can see when that shock wave or that bio shock hits the magnetic field, it compresses it. Okay. When that compresses, then it causes all kinds of issues with the ionosphere. It can cause problems with uh, inducing currents on wires and electronics and all those kind of things. So uh, when we see really big solar flares, uh, we can have some real issues and, and we, you know, I uh, believe it was either Saturday or Sunday we saw an M-class solar flare uh, which gave a, a radio blackout over the Indian Ocean and uh, we're impacting by the CME today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but let's uh, take a look at the next slide. Okay, so when we were talking about um, the impact from a solar flare, okay, so you can see this red area that's a lot of energy hitting the atmosphere and when that red area passes over you so when you get a solar flare whatever side of the earth is facing the sun at that point in time will get the high the high energy uv x-rays and that'll cause that area to, to maybe suffer a radio blackout um, and then when the cme impacts you start to see impacts from you know the compression of magnetic field so again there's some really good good tools out there we'll talk a little bit about those tools in a second but let's really get into the the nuts and bolts of this and we've got enough background now we can kind of talk intelligently about what we is we're looking at okay 
So, solar terrestrial data sources. Um, if you're familiar with QRZ or DX Heat or any of the DX clusters, um, you'll start to see this little box pop up here. Um, N0, NBH, uh, develop this little widget, as we call it. And it's got some really good information for us. But there's uh, several sources you can pull this from. You can pull it, like I said, from hamqsl dot com slash solar HMT, uh, html um, and that'll bring you to n0 um, nbh's website and you can pull down these widgets and he also has some great explanations and then you have uh, NOAA which is the no National um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Association or uh, agency which is responsible for space weather prediction as well as weather prediction on the earth all those kind of things, part of the National Weather Service. Um, so they have a, a particular website called the Space Weather Prediction Center. And that's really a cool website. Um, we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. But that website brings a lot to the table. And there's some dashboards there for radio and a bunch of other things which we can look at, which will help us determine a lot of things going on. And then there's spaceweathernews.com, which gathers. It's a kind of a, a clearinghouse for a lot of this information. And then Tamitha, Dr. Tamitha Sokov, uh, she, you'll see her on, um, uh, sometimes on, uh, what is it, Ham Nation. Uh, she has a YouTube channel, uh, space, space Weather Women, uh, space, space Weather Woman .com is her website. Uh, she's a solar physicist, uh, brilliant lady, does a really good explanation of, of, of doing a job of explaining what's going on with the sun and how it affects us and she's a licensed ham as well um, she probably does a lot better job uh, than I do and she's a lot easier to look at so check her out she does uh, like I said an, a wonderful job brilliant lady um, and just just you know great explanation so um, and also Noah um, on uh, WWV puts out HF propagation con or solar conditions um, on 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 15 megahertz, and 20 megahertz at 18 minutes after the hour. So if you turn your radio to 5 megahertz or one of those other frequencies, you, and you can hear WWV, you'll hear uh, the solar terrestrial data. Okay, like I said, most of the spotting clusters, QRZ, all have this widget up. So we're going to start talking about this widget. And, and you know, for the most part, it looks a little intimidating, uh, but it is actually uh, not too bad. So... Uh, key components, all right? Up in the corner, you have the solar flux. You have sunspot number, which is SN. Then you have the A index. Um, you have the K, which is the K. Then you see the slash planetary, so that's KP. Um, you say X-ray flux, um, and that's the flaring component. You see uh, the solar wind strength. You see proton flux, electron flux, interplanetary planetary magnetic field. Uh, you see the band uh, prop. Uh, predicted band conditions globally, um, and then you see the UH, uh, VHF conditions globally and the usable uh, mac maximum usable frequency, the MUF. And then you also see a picture of the sun. Now, when there's sunspots, you'll see dark on the sun, and that makes it kind of cool. Um, also, uh, K and KP, um, or K, K index, KP index, and the A index are all related, okay? So let's first talk about the K index, okay? So K index is the disturbance of the magnetic field around the Earth, okay? And again, that affects us uh, because when the magnetic field gets turned up and compressed, it creates noise and, and other issues for HF propagation. Um, so when we talk about the K index, there's magnetometers around the globe, and those magnetometers measure the difference in the magnetic field of the Earth, how, you know, how it's reacting to space weather, uh, and every three hours, all of those are averaged, and that gives us um, a KP index. So you have a local K index, which is the measured mag magnetometer every three hours, and then that is averaged uh, with the other ones around the globe, and that gives us the KP, and it gives us the stability of the uh, magnetic field globally. Okay, so that's the KP index. Now, that's a three-hour cycle. Okay, so conditions can vary rapidly. So they created the A uh, index, which is a 24-hour averaging of 
the KP index. So they take all the KP indexes, the last eight measurements. So that'd be every three hours times eight, 24 hours. And then they use that in a magnet and a mathematical formula algorithm to massage it. And they come up with the A index, which is more indicative of what the actual magnetic conditions are. So the really ones we're concerned about are the SFI, which is a solar flux index. We're concerned about the sunspot number, a SN number. We're concerned about the KP number, the A number. We can look at both of those, okay? And then we wanna talk about the, mag, uh, the maximum usable frequency, okay? Uh, those are what's really important to us as ham radio operators. Um, the other numbers, you can get some information from that. So when that electron flux um, is higher, you're gonna have better propagation. Um, when the interplanetary magnetic field, that, that affects some things because every two weeks we cross um, the sun's uh, magnetic um, uh, um, magnetic uh, wave, okay? So the sun is a rotating magnetic field. It puts off a wave and we cross that up every two, two weeks. And so we experience the sun's uh, magnetic field, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And so that affects us a little bit in our magnetic field. Uh, so it doesn't roll our magnetic field around or anything, but it does roll it up a little bit and uh, we end up with some disturbance in the magnetic field. Uh, so that can give us some information. And down here are some general conditions, okay? Yes, for the most part, they'll be okay, but I really don't pay attention to this a whole lot down here with these uh, HF conditions because those are really global conditions. They're not specific to your area. Um, and up in the corner here, you see the K and the A value. Okay, so the KP value is here. They have zero through nine, and then you have the A values, which are zero through 400. Um, when you see a KP index of, you know, four, you know, that's a low level geomagnetic storm. Uh, when you start to get up into this five, six, seven, eight, nine range, that's really uh, catastrophe looking to happen. Um, this can have various uh, main major issues for the planet. If we ever see a KP index of nine, uh, we're probably going to lose the grid. We're probably going to lose the internet. Uh, we'll go revert back to basically um, life before electricity. Yeah, it's just that's what we're looking at because transformers we've blown. Uh, we never want to see that 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 K value of nine or two hundred plus. Uh, we really don't want to see a seven or eight because the magnetic field's really weakening around the Earth, and um, that lets in a lot of particles. You know, so. Um, but we'll take a look at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Site. So um, this is a really good site. They use a little bit different terminologies. Uh, they have R, S, and G. Um, the R is a radio blackout. So when you see this start to get, um, you know, R1, R2, R3, that means we're looking at some uh, some conditions which cause radio blackout. The S is a solar radiation, which basically is more akin to the polar regions, north and south poles, where you get a lot of energy coming in, where the magnetic field curves down, and you end up with a lot of um, uh, high energy particles that can create HF blackout, radio blackout. It can cause problems for electronics in those areas. It really causes problems for spacecraft and for uh, planes flying over the polar regions when you have a lot of that because that can cause issues with health and uh, electronics, like I said. So uh, you, that that's something to watch. And then you have the G, which is the geomagnetic storm, uh, which is that KP index kind of thing. So they give you the current conditions. They give you the latest conditions for the last 24 hours, and then they give you a predictive. Okay. And then we start talking about, we talked about solar flares. Well, solar flares come in five varieties, A, B, C, M, and X, okay? And they it's an exponential growth. Um, and there's numbers associated, you know, so you can have an A9, a B9, a C9, an M9, and then an, an X9, and, and you can go higher. Um, that's the severity of the flare. Uh, M's can 
play some havoc with us. X's definitely play havoc with us if they're aimed at us. Um, now the sun's flaring, you know, quite a bit, so you see uh, parts of the atmosphere or parts of the sun may flare off the side where it's not going to affect us. Uh, but if it flares directly at us, we're going to see some energy, and that's uh, a whole different animal uh, that we don't want to deal with. And they put out this. Um, solar x-ray flux which is basically the flaring component you can see the type of flare and then you can see what the activity is now everybody asked me about what these drop-offs are and for the most part the sun's always giving off x-ray flux and in, in some kind of flaring and it's akin to a b-class solar flare or high a-class solar flare um, occasionally it'll burp and it stops for a second and you get these dropouts okay but when you start to see when you start to see m-class and x-class flares um, you know, we got a lot of sunspot activity going on and, uh, that's going to play a little bit of havoc with us, uh, for short periods of time for radio, uh, blackout, but it does help us a little bit and gives us some charging of the atmosphere. Uh, the solar proton flux, I wouldn't worry too much about this. It's kind of advanced to really look at that for any kind of propagation information and geomagnetic, uh, activity. Like I said, when you start to get G1, G2, G3, those things really start to get noisy. The bands get noisy. It's hard to... Uh, get propagation because the the ionosphere and the magnetic sphere are all turned up uh, makes it very difficult for us okay so let's talk about the basic interpretation okay so when you see sfi numbers uh you know they go zero to th uh, i'm sorry zero to 300 plus okay um and zero is really not a, a real number for that it's really in the 60s okay um, when you look at SFI, um, it, you know, very rarely goes below like 64, 65, 66. That's it's no sunspots for a lot of days. Okay. Cause the sun does put off all UV energy all the time. I mean, you have to shut the sun off really to get a zero. Uh, but the higher that SFI, the better off you are. Okay. And that's an algorithm or uh, analogous to the sunspot number. So, when you have more sunspot numbers, more UV radiation, more SFI, okay? And there's some general rules of thumb. Zero to 10 is going to give you 64 to 70, right, in SFI. So zero to 10 sunspots give you um, an SFI, maybe 64 to 70. Um, and, you know, bands above 40 are going to be poor or not usable. So 40 meters will be usable. 80 will be usable. 160 will be usable, you know, depending on noise obviously uh atmospheric noise thunderstorms those kind of things when you start to get 35 to 70 sunspots then your sfi will, or uh, 10 to 35 sunspots your sfi will jump up between 70 and 90 for the most part and now you have poor to fair conditions on 20 meters um and 40 and 80 you're going to be better and then when you start to get 70 to 105 you start to look at an sfi that's going to be, um, you know, 120 plus. So when you start to get above 100, really 90 uh, for a couple of days. Now it's it's a factor that builds, right? So you got you can't have just one day. I mean, propagation on a day where you have like a 130 or 140 would be really good for that day. But for sustained propagation, uh, you really need a couple of days that have sol high solar flux numbers, and you'll start to see really good propagation. Okay. Now, again. That's the good side of things. The bad side of things are the geomagnetic uh, conditions. So when you see the KP index high or the A index high, um, you know when you start to see that KP get into that four range, stuff gets noisy. Um, you're looking at you know S5, S6 noise um, somewhere in there for background noise. That's not you know any kind of electrical or uh, man-made noise. That's going to be just the background noise is going to be you know level five, level six. When you start getting up here, um, you're starting to look at you know uh, nine S nine plus of noise. You're not gonna you're not gonna hear anything. It's just it's it's nuts. You don't you don't want to be in that situation. Um, so again, I just developed this little chart to kind of give you the four you know the the three real basic things that'll help you is when the sunspot number's high, the SFI's number's high, and the KP index is low. We should have good propagation. Okay, or the A index is low. We should have good propagation. Now. When the SFI starts to creep up, those low bands, 80 and 160, there's some noise involved with that. So um, 80 and 160 may not be great, but 40 will be good and, and up will be good. And, and, and 
this weekend we had some really good propagation on 10 and 12 yesterday which was the um 10th of october um i was working you know europe on 10 and 12 meters early in the day so uh propagation was really good so we're starting to see that sunspot cycle pick up uh so yeah just keep an eye on sfi the the sunspot number and the kp and that'll give you a good idea what conditions are going to be for certain bands okay and then we start to talk about the uh, advanced interpretation or the secondary indices which are the x-ray flux proton flux and the electron flux okay like we talked about the x-ray flux when you get a flare it's going to be on the earth's facing side of the of the globe or the sun facing side of the globe you're going to see a radio blackout when you start to get in to the m class and the x class flares for sure uh, proton flux it's going to be in the polar region same thing with electron flux polar regions only uh, are going to see uh, well of course it can bleed down more when you get you you'll get those are polar regions you know 60 degrees or higher in latitude um, and then as you get more and more energy those things will start to drift down uh, they were expecting a g2 class magnetic storm um, so we were looking at auroras and uh, stuff down to 55 degrees of latitude which is like northern new york um, so but we didn't we actually didn't see it but you know again these are secondary um, again if you look at an x-ray flux if we have a flare like that um, it's going to affect it could be short term couple minutes or it could be long term if the big flare could be looking at you know hours to days of radio blackout so um, but that'll give you some idea of what you're looking at and how long those impacts can last um, all right so let me back this up one more time okay so we know right now we're looking at you know sunspot number sfi kp or a index to kind of determine which bands are going to be good right the higher the sfi the higher sunspot number the lower the kp index is the better the higher bands are going to be and when i talk about higher bands 20 17 15 12 10 6 um you know 40 and 80 are pretty much always usable for the most part unless we have just really crappy conditions with the kp index um so That'll give you what bands you're starting to look at, okay? And then the X-ray flux plays a part in that, of course. That's almost instantaneous, you know, for us. When that X-ray flux jumps, we're already, you know, if you're on the facing the sun, you're already in that radio blackout. So um, that's where we're at with that. So again, as we go through these advanced interpretations, just keep in mind that this X-ray flux with these big flares, um, they don't happen very often. Um, you're probably talking about... Oh, I don't know. X-class flare is about 150 every 11 years. So M-class a little more, you know, 350 or so of those every 11 years. So, you know, um, actually, uh, M-class, we've seen probably about 5,000 every 11 years. But really, the higher end, M5 or above, is probably 350. Um, sun's a pretty calm star, so uh, we don't see big flares. But let's talk about some of the other tools we can use. Uh, when we're talking about um, HF propagation and, and figuring out, you know, um, where where things are coming from. So, again, we talked about the beacon network earlier. Um, so the beacon network um, is the uh, Northern California DX Foundation and the AIRU have a beacon network built uh, where you have um, lots of uh, beacons around the world. I think there's 18 of them, and they're positioned in different spots now. Again, the beacon network, uh, some of those beacons aren't on the air all the time. Uh, sometimes they go down uh, like anything else. But what they do is they send out um, in CW uh, on a certain frequency. And I have the frequencies listed here. Um, uh, or I'm sorry, down here uh, where all the different frequencies are on 20 meter band, the 17 meter band, 15 meter band, 12 meter band, 10 meter band. And then all the locations are over here in this group. Um, so you can see all the 18 different locations. And um, basically it sends out uh, in Morse code uh, the call sign of the station um, at 22 words a minute. And the call sign and the first dash, so it'll go uh, the call sign and five dashes. That call sign and the first dash are 100 watts. The remaining dashes are sent at 10 watts, 1 watt, and 100 milliwatts. So, um, and it... 
at the end of each 10 second segment of transmission, the beacon steps to the next higher band and uh, rotates through. So these will rotate through as you're looking at them, the United Nations and then to Canada and then uh, United States, Hawaii, and they rotate through. Okay, so um, just keep that in mind. If you can turn, tune to like maybe 14100 and listen for that uh, Morse code, okay, and you can log on to the beacon um, uh, online and see which beacons are, are calling. If you don't know Morse, you can at least see who's broadcasting on what frequency at that point in time, right? And so when you get that beacon network going, and you're able to hear that particular, say you can hear the beacon in Finland, then you know at 100 watts on more on, on CW, at least you can hear Finland. So you know that kind of that time of day, you're going to be able to hear Finland on that frequency. And you may want to try and listen in or look at the DX clusters and see if there's a station from Finland on sideband that you can figure out what frequencies it's on and try to tune in and see if you can hear them. Um, now, there's no guarantee because, again, Morse code, a very tight um, bandwidth in regards to what it's doing. So a lot of that power, if you're transmitting 100 watts, all that power is in that narrow band versus uh, 100 watts being spread out in the bandwidth uh, for uh, sideband, which is, you know, 2,700, 3,000 hertz thereabouts. Uh, so that energy doesn't, it gets dispersed a little bit more. The nice thing about the uh, uh, the beacon network, you can also put it, if you have one of those ham clocks or Raspberry Pi clocks um, that a lot of hams are putting in their shacks now, you can actually put the beacon network up and it'll show you what's beaconing at that point in time. So um, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it's a pretty cool little application. Uh, but, you know, you can use that beacon network to see what's going on. Uh, there's other thing, tools that I know a few hams in our club are doing, um, things like the um, uh, listening to an SDR. Uh, so they'll pull up an SDR. There's plenty of them around the world, and I, I don't remember the website now off the top of my head. It's just popped in as I was doing this. I should have probably prepared for this, but they'll pull up an SDR, say, in Maine or in California, and they'll put they'll put their call sign out there, um, and they'll look f to see if they can hear themselves on the SDR through the computer. And if they can, then they know they got propagation in those areas. Um, you can use uh, you can also use the reverse beacon network where you send it out in Morse code, and 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 you'll be able to see yourself spotted on a website for that. Um, you can also use FT8, it's really good. Um, uh, you can go out and put your signal out there and you'll kind of see, uh, where it's coming back by w, uh, PSK reporter. Uh, but again, when you're talking about Morse code and you're talking about FT8, you know, Morse code, not so much, but FT8 is really a weak signal. So, uh, propagation on FT8 does not necessarily mean you're going to have propagation on sideband. Same thing with CW. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have propagation on sideband if you're working sideband. Um, you know, FT8, a lot of people use it. It's very popular, especially because it's weak signal. You make a lot of contacts easily. Um, it's a little bit automated, so you don't have as much uh, uh, work to do. Uh, so, you know, just some tools that you can use. The other one that's really kind of cool is called VoaCap. And VoaCap uh, was built for the Voice of America radio network, and it gave propagation predictions around the globe based on current solar conditions. So, Basically, let's say you're trying to work a certain part of the globe. Um, you know, like this person's up in the Nor Nordic countries and they're trying to work down into Brazil, okay? Or Brazil to the Nordic countries, whichever way that, that thing was set up. You enter your information and it turns out a, a chart um, like this, which has uh, on the outside, you have the zero through 23, which is the hours UTC. And then you have, coming down the vertical column, you have 10 meters, 12 meters, 15 meters, 17 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters, 60 meters, 80 meters. Um, so that gives you each of the bands. And then each of the uh, little sections are for the bands per hour. And then you have in the middle, it has what, uh, what band you're looking at for a particular uh, connection. And then it gives you color-coded percentages of success. Now, again, there's nothing guaranteed here, but it'll tell you, you know, kind of what to look for at what time of day um, for that particular, what band, what time of day for that particular connection. So let's say there was a de-expedition down uh, Fiji. I don't know. I'll well, just use that, right? So you would put in your QTH and you would put in the island of Fiji 
uh, kind of just put the grid squares there. It's close enough. And then you would, you know, send it on its way and it would develop this chart for you and tell you, okay, you know, just for, you know, let's say this was that for Fiji. Um, at 10, uh, you, 10, uh, 10 hundred hours UTC on 12 meters, you have a pretty good uh, chance in 11, 12, 13. So um, 10, 10 in the morning, 11 noon, and, and 1,300 hours UTC, you have a pretty good chance, about a 90% chance of making contact on 12 meters for that particular uh, thing. And then again, it happens to jump up again at, at 1,600 hours and 1,700 hours. So uh, pretty interesting stuff if you want to take a look at it that way. Um, again, it's a really neat uh, program. Uh, it's www.voocap.com or voacap.com. Um, there's other software like HamCap, HamWaves, websites like hfpropagation.com uh, that you can use uh, for that. So um, that pretty much uh, ends the slideshow for tonight and, and our conversation. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd like to show you one more thing. Let me just pull this up real quick and uh, uh, let me get this up on my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry about that. That wasn't supposed to come up there, but let me pull it up here. This is Space Weather News Prediction, WWWS uh, Weather Prediction Center, NOAA.gov. And let me move this over to where you can see it. Okay, so um, they are um, extended the watch for the uh, G2 magnetic storm until tomorrow. I guess it was moving a little bit slower than they expected. Uh, so we may see some... Uh, uh, elevated geomagnetic activity. But uh, up here, you have the dashboard sections, and the dashboard section um, will give you radio, okay? And you can come down here and look at uh, the solar condition currently, um, and that is uh, uh, 195 angstroms, I think, and uh, it shows you uh, what the sun looks like in those conditions. This is the, uh, I think it's Soho, um, and it'll show you a coronal mass ejection. Now, when you get one, it's all the way around. They call it halo ejection, and that actually is bad news for us because it means it's pointing right at us. So uh, when that stuff gets here, it'll be here. And then this is the auroral, uh, so you can see where the aurora borealis would be in the northern hemisphere. And then here's your X-ray flux, your uh, proton flux, and your KP index. And see, we took a KP4 earlier today, which was associated with the coronal hole stream, and it's jumped back up uh, to a 3 so that means that coronal uh, or that uh, coronal mass ejection CMEs uh, probably starting to impact us now, and that'll be uh, it'll be a long duration event. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, when you're looking at it uh, for that uh, radio communications dashboard. Uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, there weren't I don't think there were any real big solar flares today. Yeah, there was one C class, but that doesn't really uh, bode. It won't show you much, but uh, this map will light up when we get a good solar flare. Um, and uh, you'll see the frequency. So uh, where the absorption is one by one dB, so that means the D layer is absorbing a lot of the uh, energy that you're putting up in the atmosphere, and it's 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 15 megahertz, 20 megahertz, all the way up 35 megahertz. Um, and it'll show here as well, and it'll show the amount of absorption uh, on this, uh, excuse me, on this, uh, this chart, and it'll show you the color on that. And it's an animated thing. You can go ahead and press it, and it'll load up and um, it'll give you uh, the animation. You're not going to see much on here uh, with this one because of the, uh, we didn't have any real solar flares today. If I could pull up one from yesterday, different story. Um, and again, it gives you the solar, the aurora, and the um, also the, uh, uh, the sun version. And it gives you a little space weather uh, information for the solar flare proton flux and geomagnetic. But just a really cool website. Um, one of the other ones I, I brought up was uh, space weather. Uh, let's see, space, space, space weather news. Well, if, I, if I can spell right, S P A C E W E A T H E R uh, H T H E R dot com. Space weather news. I uh, want space weather news, not space weather dot com. Uh, I'm not real fond of that one, but this one is very similar to the, the space weather, uh, uh, the NOAA uh, space weather pre prediction site. And this actually has the enroll spiral, uh, which shows you what's coming at the Earth. When we have a CME, um, this little spiral here shows you what's going on. Earth is this little yellow dot right here. So you can see a little while ago there was a uh, CME off the off the uh, side of the sun facing away from us. 
and it's going away and it's going to impact pretty much no planets, uh, at least in the near solar system and uh, inside the uh, asteroid belt anyways. Uh, so this is the overall view. This is the stream view and this is the side view of uh, shows you, you know, how wide that uh, thing is vertically north to south. And then, of course, then you have your um, plasma speed and all those kind of things. And you can research some of this. It's kind of cool. And then again, your KP index and your uh, geo uh, magnetometer readings, proton flux and electron flux, all of that. So another cool site. Um, these guys have a really good YouTube channel too. Uh, so just check those guys out. But uh, other than that, um, I think we're um, you know in uh, pretty good stead. Again, if you have questions, uh, please just um, send me uh, a note uh, via my um, uh, email address, nj4z at ycars.org. Or you can um, look me up on QRZ if you didn't copy that down. NJ4Z is my call sign. My, my email is good there. Um, also, you can put them down in the comments. I'll take questions there. But again, thank you so much for joining us this evening for the YCARS uh, presentation meeting. Again, I uh, apologize it's not live. Uh, we tried to do it live, and um, it, uh, the Internet and the computer system at the clubhouse was not interacting well. Um, so uh, we weren't able to get out of the quality product. So I wanted to record it. I think it's valuable information, um, regardless of your level as a ham. And again, if you find something that you question or um, are not in agreement with, please let me know. Um, uh, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not perfect, and I do as much research as I can uh, to give a quality product out. But I want to make sure that uh, we're um, uh, giving you out good information and not misinformation. So with that, I will bid you all a fine 73. Stay healthy, stay safe, and of course, stay passionate about amateur radio. Uh, look us up uh, on Facebook. That's Y Cars and our YouTube channel. Uh, of course, you found us there with uh, if you're watching this, and um, also our website www.ycars.org. We're located in York County, uh, South Carolina, but we take members anywhere because we, we're a virtual club as well. Uh, we hold all our meetings virtually. Uh, presentations are live stream. And so uh, we'd love to have you join us at Y Cars. Uh, we've got a fine dynamic club. So again, 73, good evening, uh, NJ4Z, and I will be out.